uh, that sort of era of hyper globalization has come to an end. We're now in a era of superpower rivalry with between China and America, uh, and we're so we're every, we're all sort of trying to. Every country has to try and navigate. I have the great pleasure to host today in Elia Mep's podcast series, Simon Nixon, Chief Leader, Writer in London Times. Simon, thank you very much for finding the time to have this discussion. And my first question to you is about the war in Ukraine. Are the sanctions against Russia working? Is Russia losing also the economic war? Because sometimes it feels like Russia is getting by very well financially, economically. Mm. Yes, well, I think... Um, uh, on the surface, it looks as if Russia is getting away uh, with it economically, because uh, um, if one looks at it through the prism of the exchange rates, and they, you know, they've, um, you know, managed, the ruble has managed to, having fallen after the invasion, has recovered very dramatically, and um, uh, and helped by big inflows of current account onto the current account from sales of oil and gas. So. Uh, you know, uh, to, to the from the outside, it looks as if um, if Russia's coped, and certainly for anybody who hoped at the beginning that sanctions would lead Russia to, uh, uh, you know, would deter Russia from invading at all, um, then uh, you know, or or uh, then then it's been a in that sense one could say that you know, it looks as if the sanctions haven't worked. What I would say though is that that is um, I, I think that 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 un- misunderstands two things. Firstly, that that sanctions have been effective in the sense that they have um, shown the Western unity. Uh, I think that's important in its own right. I think that's, you know, every round of sanctions sends another message to uh, to Moscow. But more importantly, on the economic front, too, uh, I think that there's um, uh, that this narrative that Russia is uh, is doing well economically is um, is being sustained through tricks and Gimmicks essentially uh, by, uh, by by the Russian authorities. Um, uh, so obviously, there's a lot of capital controls at the moment in 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 Russia. So, uh, but if one looks underneath the surface, you know there's very very significant disruption to trade. Um, as the sanctions start to bite, the current account surpluses are starting to decline. Uh, the government budget is under a lot of pressure. So there's not you know they've had to move to a complete war economy. Uh, and um, uh, and they can't. They're having to use their reserves, sell their what what the reserves that aren't frozen. Uh, they're having to sell those to fund their war spending. Um, and so uh, I think that you know the the sanctions are having an effect in long term degrading of the Russian economy and and uh, its ability to continue fighting the war. So I'm certainly not suggesting that um, that. Uh, that, that Russia's and you know it's a big economy that it's about to be you know that it's about to collapse in any way. But I think it's there is a it's a, it's becoming the sanctions are making are a constraint on Russia's ability to 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 continue to fight the war in the way that it would um, want while maintaining public support. That it, it is having an impact impact on people in Russia and on the government's ability to to finance itself. So I think that uh, you know it was always going to be a long process of. Um, uh, of sanctions to have that impact. I think it is having an impact. I think the West shouldn't lose heart over that. Many people now are beginning to talk, many discuss about the necessity of ending the war. And I, I can say that there are uh, two sides in this story. There are the rea- realists that they say that we must continue to talk with Russia and Vladimir Putin and find a way to negotiate with him. And the other ones that say that we cannot negotiate with Vladimir Putin and that must be a decision of um, of Ukrainians, how they're going to deal with that. And as long as Vladimir Putin is the head of Russia, that would be impossible. Do, do you see at any point having negotiations with, uh, with Putin at this moment or uh, ending the war? No, I don't see it. I mean, I don't see how. I mean, I mean. Firstly, I think that uh, uh, I totally agree. I totally think it, it has to be a decision for um, for the Ukrainians. Um, uh, you know, at the moment, um, any uh, any negotiation, you know, at the moment, you know, it seems to me that the first would have to that allowed Putin to keep the territory that he's acquired would be. Uh, 
you know, obviously a, a, a disaster for um, for Ukraine. Um, it, but it would also be a disaster for the West because, um, or for the rest of the world, because it would be a completely, um, uh, you know, tear up the entire post world, post post war, post Second World War global order. Um, if he, you know, if it was to happen, and also I don't think any um, negotiation at the moment would even be permanent either, because um, Putin would. Regard any negotiation, negotiated settlement now as a as a uh, an opportunity to regroup and come back for more. And I think it would that Europe would then, um, you know, the Russian threat would not go away. So I don't think it's either possible from Ukraine or from the West point of view to uh, consider negotiations while um, Putin is continuing to occupy large swathes of Ukraine and showing no signs of willing to. To, to negotiate on that score so so i think that for as long as the ukrainians are want to carry on um uh fighting the west must and has to carry on supporting them and i think that um uh, that's um i think that that, that I, I certainly think that's important so now if we see the, the prolonging of the war and we see the energy crisis and prices soaring, which of course that is something that has begun even before the war, we saw gas prices uh, beginning to, to soar. Um, how do you see Europe and United Kingdom facing? Uh, do, will we see a deeper recession? Will we see them managing more hardly as time goes by and as the winter comes? Of course, in the United Kingdom, we already have uh, the winter. We don't have it uh, yet in, in Greece, but you have minus degrees and, and snow. Um, so do you think that uh, economically uh, things will get worse for Europeans and British people? Yes, well, well, obviously in in Britain we're already in recession. Um, that seems fairly clear, um, and uh, and and I think it seems fairly likely that um, that you know Europe will and possibly America too. Uh, although that may be less so likely now with America, but but I think we you know we um, I mean certainly it's a it's a huge economic shock. Uh, I think. Europe in particular has done in the EU has done incredibly well in um, in securing gas supplies to get through this winter, um, and that's um, and, and also in reducing its energy usage. I think I'm I'm, I'm a sh uh, I think it's a uh, shame to say that Britain has not done well in reducing its energy consumption, and it's taken until now for us to even start. It's only to even start a government campaign. To reduce energy use is only starting about to start this week um so uh, or next week so that's that's been a, a disappointment but i think that um uh the, the economic challenge is um is twofold for for britain and for europe which is you know in the first place to deal with the energy shock itself and, and make sure there's enough supplies and then secondly to deal with the consequences of the inflation uh and ensure that the inflation itself doesn't become so embedded that it it um, undermines the economy in the long term. I think that, um, uh, and 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 it's not clear yet how that will, um, you know, whether that that second round affects how that will play out and how much, uh, you know, how much economic tightening will be required to, to deal with the inflation shock. But um, uh, but I think that you know that it's. Um, uh, I think there will be a recession, but I don't think it necessarily has to be a deep one in. In the EU, I think it will have to be. It'll may I mean to be deeper in Britain because we have our own domestic issues, which are uh, slightly different. Well, and, and now I, I want to ask you: uh, How much has Brexit damaged United Kingdom uh, economy? Uh, if uh, Brexit hadn't happened, would you be now in in, in a better situation? Or has it affected Brexit everything from NHS? I saw for the first time that 100,000 nurses were on strike and also have so many strikes now. I mean, is that also um, something that happened because of Brexit, all those problems? And then was, of, of course, COVID, pandemic, and now the war. And everything has gone loose, I think, in, in United Kingdom. 
do, do, do you put Brexit in there in the if you think about it that Brexit has played a, a disastrous role or not? Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, I think Brexit's been a, a been a central is is an import very important factor in in the situation in Britain. You're right, we're we're having a a, a pretty difficult time at the moment, um, politically, economically. Um, uh, there's no doubt that um, that Brexit has very badly damaged, you know, has damaged the economy, um, as was always as it was always going to do. Um, you know, the uh, it, it's it's hit trade uh, badly, um, and it has uh, imposed a lot of costs on businesses um, who want to export. Uh, it's created regulatory uncertainty because nobody knows what the rules are going to be in the future, um, and perhaps most in Importantly, from the point of view of the, the economic shock we're facing with inflation, it's um, uh, it's uh, it's it's contributed and much made much worse the labour shortages because we no longer have freedom of movement, which is ironic given that freedom of movement was one of the issues that determined the Brexit result. People wanted to end it, and now, of course, it lies at the heart of our economic problems that businesses can't find enough workers. Um, and so the economy we've had, you know, uh, so the supply side of the economy has been badly hit, and that lies behind a lot of our inflation problems. So, so Brexit's been an important issue. But as for the strikes, I mean, they're also related to Brexit in the sense that uh, that in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, the Conservative governments, starting in 2010, imposed very, very tough austerity on the public sector. Uh, starved of you know and instigated pay ride pay freezes hiring freezes and so we had a very under resourced underfunded private public sector uh, and then after brexit because the economy was being hit by brexit um you know taxes have had to go up and governments find it harder to balance the books and so the pay freeze has continued for over a decade so what you're seeing now is a public sector that's had real terms pay cuts for a decade or more uh, suddenly being faced with this cost of living crisis and being asked to take an even bigger real terms pay cut uh, to keep the government books in balance. So it's a very, very, um, uh, very difficult situation. And, uh, and as I say, Brexit has, has really been a very important factor in it. And, um, uh, and of course, it's, um, uh, it's now being discussed, uh, at least in the media, and it's becoming much more, you know, openly discussed, and in business, are becoming much more open about it. But politically, you know, neither the government nor the opposition want to acknowledge it or discuss it, and that creates, and that in itself is a problem. Because if you can't discuss the problem politically, you can't begin to address it. Um, but it's politically, it's a taboo subject. And this is because of the, re the referendum. They say that people decided, so we will not discuss it. Uh, neither the Tories, nor uh, um, uh, uh, the opposition. Is that be because they think that they must respect the referendum? And do they think about having a, a, a Swiss style deal? I mean, something or a, a Norway style deal with the European Union? Or is that off the table also? Because of, yes. as you say, if you don't discuss the problem, if you don't discuss that Brexit what created problems, then how are you going to, to discuss any kind of deal with the European Union that is like uh, Switzerland or like Norway? Yes. Well, you know, it's it's really, it's, um, people don't discuss it because there's no answer. There's no solution. I mean, that's the reality. Um, you know, the, uh, you know, people throw around, you um, you know these you know the norway style deal the switzerland style deal we've been discussing this now for six years coming up you know um more than six years now uh, and uh but the reality is that um uh you know that there's no appetite or political possibility of rerunning the referendum um and um uh but the um you know but it's it's not it's really not feasible for uh, a country like Britain to get into a Norway type type deal um, where you know it's a rule taker um, for I think for an economy this size that's just not a realistic proposition. 
uh, you know, a Swiss style deal. Well, it, that can mean various different things to different people. You know, if it means just sort of small incremental deals to try and improve the situation, then then obviously that's a would be a sensible strategy. But you know, if it means sort of you know literally a Swiss style deal whereby one tries to essentially recreate customs union and single market membership through big side deals. Well, that's not something the European Union wants, um, let alone Britain. So, so I think we're stuck. I mean, the reality is we're stuck. Uh, the first and most important issue is to try and resolve the Northern Ireland issue, which was always, which was never discussed in the referendum, but was always the single most, always going to be and has been the single most difficult issue. There's some optimism around at the moment, you know, in briefings that maybe a deal there is coming soon. I, I, I will always be sceptical uh, because I think, you know, it's so hard to bridge the differences. Um, but I think that, uh, I, I think, you know, as I, say, I think the reason it's not discussed is because nobody really knows how to resolve it. Um, and, and, and for as long as it's not, as long as, long as this, um, uh, we're stuck in this bad deal, this suboptimal deal, the, you know, Britain will continue to pay the economic price as from diverging from from its main markets and from its main partners. So you told me before that um, uh, there were pay cuts and you know, for, for 10, 12 years, uh, people suffered from pay cuts and all that. Now we have the elevated prices, higher interest rate in the house market. And uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but we saw the British government uh, that they, they chose in the last week's budget to cut taxes on the banks. Is that correct? Um, yes. Um, what is the logic a... be behind that? I, I, I don't understand. Well, yes, it's, it was an odd thing to have done. Um, uh, it was certainly an odd thing to have done. There was a long-standing supplementary tax on the banks, um, which, uh, uh, and I, I you know, I think the logic of it was that that um, corporation tax was being increased quite dramatically, and so uh, so they removed the the added tax on the banks. But it was um, uh, so you know, I mean, uh, I thought it was an odd thing to have done because um, you know, for very technical reasons, which is that um, at the moment. The government is having to pay is having to the, 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 the government is having to pay very substantial amounts of money to the Bank of England for to, to cover the losses on all the bonds that were brought under the QE program, uh, and so uh, you know keeping the tax would have been a sort of windfall tax to try and reimburse to cover the costs of finance the Bank of England, but for whatever reason you know the government decided to. To not do it, maybe it felt that going into what could be a deep recession with house prices falling, they needed to protect the banks. I mean, I don't believe that was necessary, but you know, it was an odd thing to have done. I agree. <laughs> okay, and my last question to you is: You recently wrote that China's dilemma over COVID could spill into a world trade trade war. What do you mean exactly by that? Why could that happen? Well, I, I think what I was trying to um, uh, make the point is that uh, you know, the, the West is trying to grapple with a very, you know, with trying to do something quite difficult at the moment, which is to try and um, ring fence bits of the bits of trade that are national, you know, prioritize national security in its trading with China and trying to uh, um, remove to, to try to, to try to ring fence those bits of the economy which are most sensitive uh, without disrupting all of trade and that's quite a tricky thing to do because uh, you know China is then trying to do this is also trying to do the same to strength you know to protect its own economy and the danger is that you know you, we I mean we're I think we've moved from we've essentially we have to say that I think the era of globalization as we used to know it of the rules-based system is essentially um, uh, that sort of era of hyper-globalization has come to an end. We're now in a 
era of superpower rivalry with, between China and America. Uh, and we're, so we're, every, we're all sort of trying to, every country has to try and navigate that. Um, but, and the, the danger is that that rivalry will now play out in every single sphere of activity. And, you know, so everything from finance to energy, resources, uh, polar exploration, space exploration, everything, you know, that, and, the, and all of those rivalries, there's a danger that they could, all of them could spill over into conflict. And but I think that the, what one, um, what the both sides need to try and avoid doing is allowing that rivalry to turn into a cold war. And that would be ruinous for, uh, for everybody, um, where essentially one has to sort of go for a complete decoupling of Chinese and American systems in which the whole world then has to choose a side. And, and I think that would be um, hugely economically damaging. And I think the risk of that is, is quite high because of the danger of this rivalry spilling over into conflict. So I think that, that what I was trying to say in that piece was that uh, in the same way that China and America are trying to, you know, set out their red lines around Taiwan and the South China Sea and in the diplomatic sphere, the, in the geopolitical sphere, trying to set out rules of engagement and lines of communication and to avoid that rivalry spilling over into a war. I think in the economic sphere, the West and China have to do the same thing. They have to try and work out what the new rules are going to be for this new trading system in which both sides want to protect their legitimate national security interests in the economy, which may mean decoupling in areas of technology, but without allowing that to spill over into a cold war that would then become very, very destabilizing and economically damaging for everybody. Thank you, Simon. Thank you very, very much for this discussion. Thank you. Well, thanks for asking me. It was a pleasure. Thank you.